I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. He's the CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Well, it's great to be back, Jim. I certainly have a lot of... Uh headlines uh, in the news uh, lately that are going to keep, uh, I think, the policymakers and investors on edge uh, as we head into the summer here. For the first time, polls show that the people who want to get out of the European Union are leading in Britain. Well, and it's not just one poll, it's, it's multiple polls. Now, I've been trying to dig down into these polls to see what the methodology is, and it's very hard to um, from this side of the Atlantic anyway, to drill down and get that. So there's always the chance that uh, these polls are biased towards uh, a group of the in the population that are, you know, in favor of leaving, um, particularly people maybe who are a little bit uh, older uh, and more conservative and, you know, stick with landlines and, and spend a lot of time on the Internet. Um, I mean, that's the, that you know, that's got to be the... the the hope here of the Remain camp that those polls are biased, but there's so many polls that now are coming that way that it's 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 hard to dismiss that uh, trend. And what we I think we've got here is a reaction to globalization and this whole concept of empowerment of uh, people who are plugged in to a global network and. Uh, you know, uh, the EU is, you know, a, sort of a sub-network of this globalization. And you know, uh, people are, you know, are having some second thoughts about that. Not everyone, not those who have been winning in the game, but those who are losing. And, and not just losing economically. I think uh, there's also now uh, pretty clear that social costs and social cultural issues are up on, you know, are on the table for debate, and whether politicians want to debate them or not, um, unfortunately, they're here. So we'll have to see how it goes. Uh, I was skeptical initially on these polls that said the Brexit was leading, but now there's so many that have come that way, it looks like it's uh, becoming uh, better than a 50-50 proposition. We know polls in the past, though, can be very misleading. I look at the last B.C. election where the NDP went into it with a 22% lead in the polls. What went wrong there for them? Well, well, what went wrong for them was, wasn't the polls. It was how they uh, responded to uh, the Senior Morgan pipeline. That's what went wrong for them. And, uh, well, you know, so the polls didn't pick, capture that up, except the, uh, ironically, the B.C. Liberal Party internal polls. <laughs> they were all kind of wondering, what's the fuss all about? We're going to win. So uh, the, um, uh, the polls can be wrong, and they may be wrong in Brexit. But uh, and, and apparently, now I haven't checked the uh, the booking lines in the UK, but apparently they're still uh, the 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 odds still favor the stays. But uh, I would say that that bet's getting uh, dicier and dicier every day now because the momentum seems to have switched and. Every trick that the Remain camp is leaving doesn't seem to be working. So, excuse me. So we'll have to see how that goes. And um, you know, now, uh, David Cameron trying the uh, "you're going to lose your pension" um, card. So we'll see how that works. Is he right when he says that? I think you could lose your pension with or without Brexit. I'm not saying you're going to. I don't. I don't think Brexit is the. Uh, it would be the catalyst for that. Now, I'm not, uh, I, I haven't listened to his argument, but to me it sounds like a bit of scaremongering. Um, if anything, uh, you may see a guilt yields tick up a bit, and that could be good for pension plans. So I, I, I'm not convinced, though, I'm not. But uh, maybe there's a, maybe there's a uh, argument there that I'm not aware of, but uh, I think that 
that's a little bit of fear, a lot of fear mongering. It's it's a vote getting type maneuver for sure. It looks like the Germans are very nervous. The German ten year bond is now trading below zero, and also I've heard that Germany believes it would cost them at least fifty billion dollars if Britain leaves the EU. Well, you know, Jim, one thing that Germans should be grateful for is that the uh, this election, uh, this referendum is in June and not at the end of July because then everybody's uh, holidays, you know, and the and German government would have to be cancelled if there was a Brexit. Well, now they'll be able to work through July on, on what the aftermath is uh, if there is a Brexit. And, you know, I, I personally, I, you know, I tend to believe that these uh, are old, these situations are overblown by vested interests on both sides. And that uh, the outcome, while significant, won't be as dire as uh, the Remain camp is saying. But, you know, one has to plan for a worst-case scenario. And there will be repercussions for uh, people who are positioned and organizations that are positioned for the status quo. And, uh, you know, and it'll mean a lot of work will have to be done in June and July by um, by policymakers in the Eurozone. And, um, you know, the, the, you know, uh, Bureaucrats uh, and politicians are always happy to tell people that we need to be prepared for change and that we need change and and that change is good. Change is good except when it hits them in a way that they don't like it. And then change is bad. And, you know, so this will be a case, I think, of uh, the electorate sort of turning the tables on policymakers and saying, okay, here's some change for you. Go deal with it. And uh, it will be a big change. And, uh, but I have uh, every confidence that things will settle down in England, will settle down in Germany. The big question is what happens in Italy and Spain and other pockets of the, uh, of the Eurozone that may want to leave the Eurozone? What happens in Scotland? What happens in Northern Ireland? So, this could take on a life of its own, and we could be in a whole different world 12 months from now. Now, I was, you know, I would call that sort of the uh, decomposition of the European experiment. I don't put a high degree of probability on that, but it's not insignificant. It's, you know, now it's what we, we you let's give it a range, you know, 10 to. 10 to 20 percent even. Right? Well, that's a lot more than 1 or 2 percent, which I think you, or 5 percent, which you could have um, assigned to this a year ago. So the odds of the European uh, experiment falling apart have gone up. That will have implications on on uh, financial markets and European growth. And uh, it will be um, it will be certainly a spectacle to watch. Now, how, uh, how this plays out in the markets, a lot will depend on how that central banks and policymakers react, and that's the other, and that's the other um, risk here is that um, are central banks out of ammunition to counter volatility that uh, that would come with this? You know, for years the Fed uh, bought assets, and they think everything's great. There was no problem. I, I keep I keep uh, reading about victory laps that all these policymakers said, "Oh, we did such a great job stuffing the." U.S. Uh, balance sheet, the uh, Fed's balance sheet with trillions of dollars, and everything worked out just great. And uh, ECB, everything's working out great. Well, uh, and zero interest rates, everything's working out great, except, except the Fed's having a bit of a hard time getting out of them. Okay, but now what happens if they have to add liquidity to the system? If there is um, a bit of a you know a financial regurgitation, meltdown, whatever may happen after Brexit, they don't have a lot of bullets left. So what's the ECB going to do? Buy even more bonds? What's the Fed going to do? I mean, it, it, it wants to raise rates. It's desperate to raise rates, even even under the most modest of economic data points. It's looking for any excuse to raise rates. I mean, it's it's quite laughable when you think that the Fed is trying to raise rates now. When in a normal circumstance, if you had this data, they'd be talking about, well, maybe we should be cutting. You know, so we, we've got the world in terms of um, policymakers. Uh, at the, in terms of monetary policy and in some sense fiscal policy as well, it's turned on their, everything's turned on its head. You know, we, when, uh, when the Fed should be talking about loosening policy, it's talking about tightening policy. So, uh, you, you will have repercussions in Europe, but, uh, depending on how the Fed, uh, uh, plays things, and they haven't been playing things very well, uh, in the last 
six months. I know there's a whole group of people in the market who think the Fed are great and they're doing everything just wonderfully and everything's great, but it's not. I mean, the Fed is having a hard time here. They've really stick, the stick handled themselves into a deep corner and now they've got this Brexit issue which on its own they can manage, but what happens if it spins out into something else like the, the, like the breakup of the European European Union, then we've got a whole different kettle of fish. And of course, if the European Union breaks up, that means no more going between countries in Europe without having to go through customs and uh, other regulations that, of course, will boost the cost of doing business. It will, although, uh, you know, so much business now is done virtually, um, you know, through services. Uh, it, it certainly will. I mean, there's no doubt about it, it will. And you know, you you would have you you are going to get a, a a step back if that happens. There's no there's no there's no doubt about it uh, that you know you're going to get all these types of costs. And it, it, we don't know where this would go. You know, I think initially you are going to get a, a sigh of relief once it happens. You're going to get Mario Draghi, you know, saying I'll do whatever it takes. You're going to have Janet Yellen, you know, and all. Uh, saying some nice things and maybe those regional Fed presidents will stop talking about four rate hikes for a few weeks, you know. So the fire brigade will come out and we'll see if they can put, they can put it, they can uh, put out the flames. But, uh, this is going to be a, uh, this is going to be something that keeps, uh, smoldering for a while. And, um, you know, you may see, you know, you may see other countries, uh, picking up the mantle, uh, on, um, you know, in terms of leaving the European experiment. So, um, well, you know, we'll have to see. It, it's going to be a difficult time for stock market investors. Uh, you know, I keep hearing how great the U.S. economy is doing, you know, and I just don't see it. We, we, you know, we have this euphoria today in the Wall Street Journal with, you know, uh, some retail sales that have beat expectations. They beat expectations, but when you look at the 10-year graph of retail sales growth, there's one, it's one trend, Jim, and that trend is from the upper left hand side of the of the graph to the bottom right hand side. It is down, you know. So um, there's some interesting uh, spins going on in the market, and uh, so far it's worked. You've got U.S. stocks, the S and P 500 near all time highs, but it's the only market in the world, you know, as far as major markets go, that's near all time highs. I can tell you that insiders in the United States are more prepared to take profits than they are to put on positions, even during periods of weakness. You've even got gold uh, insiders in Canada taking money off the table because they're not sure what's going to happen because, you know, you've got a Fed that's determined to raise rates. I mean, determined to put uh, interest rates up, which if they do, will just clobber gold temporarily, and uh, then, you know, we'll see what happens. But the the Fed raising rates this summer in in my view, it'd be a huge policy mistake. Well, they're wor- they're living with a, pol- a series of policy mistakes. So, um, well, I, I you know I agree that it's time. It the Fed should not be at zero. The time to lift rates was a long time ago. Was you know now they're doing it in the middle of an what looks appears to be an economic slowdown. And you can and you can put lipstick on a pig all you want with with you know retail sales that have beat expectations, but the trend in U.S. economic activity for the last few months, ever since they raised rates in December, has been going lower. Also, too, I wonder if countries like Greece, Italy, Spain wish that they had their old currencies back with, because they could devalue them individually and attract more tourists. I remember the last time I went to Italy when they still had the lira, 50,000 lira was worth $45 Canadian. You felt rich for a second when you saw the 50 grand on the bill. Well, I, I don't believe that any country uh, can devalue their way to prosperity, Spain and Italy included. Now, what happened in Spain, of course, was when they had the strong euro, instead of investing in, um, in productivity, enhancing uh, investments, they invested in real estate. Now, where have I heard that? Where, where, where am I seeing that movie play out? In any event... Um, you know, it's what you make of what you, the ha- the cards you are given, and uh, some of those countries didn't play their membership uh, in the EU very very well. They're still not playing it. They're relying on ECB to bail them out instead of doing structural, meaningful structural reform. So if uh, if that's the the move that the, these countries want, the politicians want to take, and I I assume it will be because it's the easy way out 
for politicians, and politicians tend to love the easy way out. Um, and you know, usually if you can get a charismatic politician to sell the easy way out to its electorate, uh, that's the road that the society will go. It would be, a, you know, it, it, there are arguments for um, having uh, floating currencies if you're if you're going to use your market uh, discipline throughout the economy. But if you just use the market discipline on your currency, but you have a socialist economy. <laughs> Uh, driving, you know, the uh, the rest of your economy. Good luck. Well, we've seen in other nations when you decide that you want the rich to pay for everything, what the rich do is withdraw. And I think about gold mines in places like uh, Eastern Europe or Central America, where they demand very high taxes on these mines, and the mine owners just simply pack up and leave. So, so much for milking the golden goose. Exactly, it, it, and it, it doesn't even have to be taxing the rich. It can be enriching the political elite, you know. And uh, that is a it, it is a favorite theme of many governments, and uh, elected and non-elected, uh, totalitarian and, and 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 democratically elected. So, uh, you know, it, and it, it's done in subtle ways. When you're when you're a dictatorship, uh, you can be a lot more. Uh, Blunt about what, uh, how you're parceling out the winnings. When you're when you're a democracy, you have to be more subtle and coy about how you pick winners and losers. For example, in Canada, we appointed a central bank governor that decided he was going to support uh, the export industries at the cost of the poor, uh, in terms of people who uh, have to buy uh, you know groceries, and, and in terms of a big part of their their budget is devoted to groceries. So we you know in Canada we we made a decision, the government made a decision to pick winners and losers. Uh, it was just done very subtly, and very few people even recognize that, but that's exactly what happened. And so, uh, in any kind of um, organized, organized uh, democracy, you're going to have a competition of vested interests, and it's important for voters to be vigilant and to identify you know, any of these attempts to unfairly enrich one group of society, uh, uh, you know, on the backs of another. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, any thoughts on what's happening with oil right now? You know, the oil market is something that I think is uh, really hard to predict a turning point in. You know, when it was trading over $100 uh, a couple of years ago, lots of people said it was overdone. They were right. The problem was getting the timing right. And the uh, the $100 oil persisted a lot longer than a lot of people thought. So have we hit a bottom? Uh, I can tell you that in, in the United States, insiders have taken a lot of profits on this run. They're not adding to positions. They're not selling aggressively. And in Canada, the mood of insiders is better than in the U.S., but that's traditionally the case uh, in any event. So the um, the outlook for the oil patch, I would say, right now is, uh, I, I would call it sort of 50-50 in North America, maybe slightly more upside because uh, this is the uh, nature of our industry, uh, the way it's structured. Uh, there's a little bit more cushion for uh, oil exploration companies on the downside. There's more upside in the U.S. Uh, traditionally, you know, in, given the royalty structure and, well, given the, the economics of the wells and, and, and how royalties are, are, are paid in, in the two different countries. So, I, uh, I, I don't know. I, you know, I think... I think it's going to be a tough call for oil here. There's arguments that it could uh, it, it could uh, move higher, and there's arguments that uh, this still has to, to, to work out uh, on balance. What we're seeing, what we've seen in our latest rebalancing of the uh, Canadian Insider Index, what we're seeing, what insiders are doing, 
I think the workout in the oil patch still has some time to go, and I don't expect to see sort of a breakout to the upside. You know, that's based off of our signals. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see. Do you see any category that would you would call a sweetheart stock? A three heart, sorry. A sweetheart uh, stock uh, like biotechs or fangs, anything like that on the horizon. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a really good question because if you can um, if you can identify those ahead of time, you can make a lot of money. Now, uh, earlier in the year, we were talking to our clients about the gold stocks, saying this may be different this year, and so it's worked out really well. Now, but they a lot of these stocks have doubled in six months, so we're in a seasonally weak period of gold. And I think what the best scenario for gold stocks would be, would be for the Fed to plow ahead and raise rates in July, because I think that could be the last rate hike in the United States for many years, you know, and unless my read on the U.S. economy is completely off, and it could be, maybe the underlying strength is as good as um, uh, a lot of the bullish analysts are saying, uh, if the Fed raises rates now, if they're raising it because they feel they have to keep get away from zero interest rate policy, but it's the wrong time to do it, and it could be very destabilizing uh, for the global economy and, in particularly, the U.S. economy. So I would I would say stay tuned and watch the markets over the summer and see how Brexit plays out, see how um, see how the Fed plays out. In the meantime, uh, it looks like uh, long bonds have uh, the U.S. The U.S. 10-year looks like it's it's breaking to the upside, and I suspect that the U.S. 10-year here will have a good run until we get closer to the election. Um, but you know, it it will be the uh, uh, you know it will be sort of the the, the best uh, looking uh, best looking uh, horse in the stable um, this summer. And but we'll have to see come fall. Uh, then uh, we may have a we may have some more uh, some more beauty queens show up uh, onto the farm, so uh, we'll see. It, uh, you know, the, but right now it looks like the, the U.S. the U.S. Treasuries are the uh, going to be the flavor of the summer. Ted, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thanks very much, Jim. My guest has been Ted Dixon. He's the CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service. He was speaking to us from Vancouver. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. You can find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.